Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So I'm excited today. We are starting a new series on the book of Titus, and we're calling it Honor Amongst Dishonor. And so for the next three weeks, Titus is a very, very short book. There's three chapters. So for the next three weeks, this week and the next two weeks, we're going to be reading through the book of Titus, and I encourage you to, to read along with us. So this week, we, we read all of Titus chapter 1. Next week is Titus chapter 2. The week after that is Titus chapter 3. And I'm really excited for this because we typically in the church, we don't look at Titus that much. I was thinking back through like my experience in the church and when I thought of Titus being read and things like that, and typically we'll read like Titus at an ordination or an installation of a pastor. And that's like the only places that I, that I, that I hear it read or, or really see it talked about much. Because there's a lot of wisdom there for, for pastors and qualifications for pastors or elders or overseers, and, and it's good to read it in those situations. But that's not just what Titus is about. Titus is a very, very profound book that's written in a time amongst chaos in culture that gives us some very, very practical wisdom to how do we live as a follower of Jesus, especially when the, the noise around us out there in the world is loud and chaotic. As I looked at, at, at what Titus was written to, and I look at our current situation that we're living in today, I see a lot of parallels there. So I, I think, hopefully, as we go through this the next uh, three weeks, we'll be able to stand a little firmer in what it means to follow Jesus and be faithful to Jesus, especially in the midst of a chaotic world that we live in. But in order to do that, we've got to kind of understand who Titus is, what the book was all about, who was it written to, what was the culture around the book that Paul is writing about. So first off, who was Titus? Well, Titus was a guy that was a follower of Jesus along with Paul. He joined Paul on, on, on some of his journeys, and Paul left him on the island of Crete. And Paul is writing this letter to Titus as Titus is living on Crete as one of the leaders of the churches. They're kind of getting the church kind of jump-started to follow Jesus. That's who Titus is. And he's living on Crete. Does anybody here know anything about Crete? You can go visit Crete today, right? It's still called Crete. Anybody know where Crete is? Greece, all right? Yep, it's Greece. It's an island off the coast of Greece right? And it's, um, it's um, because it's an island, there's all sorts of ports and different things on it. And back in the ancient world, it was a common place where people kind of stopped over on their journeys to get to other places. So there's always people coming and going on Crete. Anybody know anything else about Crete? Just, just kind of curious. Ancient Crete. What was that? Uh, Patmos was John, uh, that's a good, good guess. It was an island. John was exiled on an island. But Crete in the ancient world was kind of known for the epicenter of Greek culture. Anybody know anything about Greek mythology? Right? Zeus, right, is the god, right? Now, there's all sorts of different lines of Greek mythology as they've been told and they've kind of been blended. So you, there's different accounts of Greek mythology. But one account, especially those on Crete, held that kind of Greek, uh, Crete was the epicenter of Greek mythology. So some people in that, that mythology believed, you know, kind of man became God, kind of Zeus ascended to this greatness. Many people believed that Zeus was from, guess where? Crete right, as well as a whole bunch of other gods, and, and they were proud of this, right, if you lived in Crete, even though this was several hundred years after all, kind of all the Zeusy stuff was going on, if you, if, you, if, if you lived on Crete, you were proud, right, that, that, the, that the gods, the Greek gods, kind of came from your island, some of them said maybe they were buried on your island, and, and you were proud of that, and if you think of it, basically, Zeus was kind of their national or their island mascot, so imagine if Zeus was like our mascot here in, in our country or our state, right? Think about what did Zeus embody, right? Zeus was this sort of mythological god that embodied taking whatever you want, right? So Zeus, right? As far as women, who could he have? Whoever he wanted, right? As far as power, Zeus could take whatever he wanted. 
So if you were Cretan back then, you were proud of kind of your heritage and Zeus, and you were kind of motivated to follow in the same line. In fact, one of the Greek philosophers said this about the Cretans. Epimenides is this Greek philosopher, this Greek poet. This is what he said about the Cretans. Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Would anybody be proud to be called that? The Cretans were, right? They embraced this motto for who they were. Always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. The men in Crete were known to take power for themselves. Many of them signed up to be mercenaries, to go fight off on these far-off battles, to get power and, and sort of glory for themselves. If you were a Cretan woman, you were known, they were known in the ancient world to kind of be like a little bit promiscuous, kind of going from house to house each night. Right? Cretans were known as liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. That's where Titus is living. So, does Titus have, a, have an easy job out for him as he's kind of starting a church there in the midst of this culture? Not really, right? It's, it's a culture where everybody was trying to fight for power for themselves. It's a culture that Titus is there kind of starting the church. And, 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 and sort of, I thought about that and how difficult it must have been for Titus to kind of live in that culture as these people are kind of lusting after the power of Zeus, so to speak. But then I kind of paused and I looked around. Is our culture really that different today? I mean, maybe, I don't, I don't think anybody here, you know, saw like a billboard saying, let's go follow Zeus or something like that on the way into church. But what is our culture always telling us? You got to fight for greatness. You got to take that power for yourself whether it's the culture of consumerism, right, where your, your phone in your pocket or even your watch is buzzing at you as you scroll through and you see different, like, influencers telling you, you can have that, you deserve that, you should go take that. Whether it's our, the gods of our politics on all sides of the political spectrum that are saying, yep, you need to take it for yourself, you need to take that power for yourself, or something else. We live in a world and a culture that's chaotic, that's always telling us, right? Take it for yourself. Right? Take that power. Ascend to that greatness yourself. And we do that at the expense of our neighbor. And there's the ascent to kind of be almost like Zeusian. We, we end up hurting those around us. That's the same type of culture that Titus was living in. It was a very, very chaotic, very, very selfish culture that he was living in. So the question is, in the midst of our culture today, and in the midst of the culture that Titus was living in on Crete, how do you remain and how do you live as a faithful follower of Jesus? And you might say, well, that, that's easy, right? If I'm going to be a faithful follower of Jesus, that's easy in the midst of a chaotic culture. We got to get back, right? We got to get back to the rules. We got to get back to order, we got to get back to all the rules in the Bible and all the morality in the Bible. It's, it's gone away. Right? We got to get back to these rules and regulations, and that will fix everything. And certainly we see people say that. Right? Almost like there are these, these, there are these cults that are out there that say, yeah, you got to get back to these, these rules and regulations where you got to follow these in the midst of this chaotic culture. But really, getting back to the rules and the regulations of religion, does that actually bring peace or hope to you or to me? Or does that just continue to bring chaos and this loudness around us? You see, in Paul's day, in Titus's day, on Crete, there, there was those that were kind of saying that. In fact, that's what Paul addresses here towards the end of chapter 1 in the book of Titus. This is what Paul writes to Titus. He says, For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers, and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. So let's pause there. The circumcision party. What's the circumcision party? It sounds like a fun party to be a part of, doesn't it? No. 
No, but seriously, like, what, what's, the, what's the circumcision party? The, Jew, the Jewish or the Jewish Christians, right, who were teaching that you had to get back to the laws, you had to get back to the rules. You had to get back to circumcision in order to follow Jesus, in order to be close to God. You had to follow the rules and the laws and the regulations. You had to get back to the rules of religion. And if you got back to the party of circumcision or to, to that law of circumcision and lived that holy life, then maybe, right, the chaos would stop. Right, that's the circumcision party. But what does Paul say about the circumcision party? right? They're insubordinate, empty talkers, deceivers. They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, look at this, have we heard this before? Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. All right, so what does Paul do? He quotes Epimendes, right? And he says, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. Who is he equating to the Cretans? Those of the circumcision party. Those that are all about the law, the rules, the regulations, right? He says, they're teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. They're basically doing the same thing that the Cretans are doing, when the Cretans are all about taking power for themselves to follow Zeus, they're basically saying man can ascend to be like the gods. And here Paul is basically saying the Judaizers, those who are saying you got to follow the rules and the regulations of, of like all these sort of cult-like rules, they're saying you can, by following those laws, ascend to be like God. They're basically saying the same thing, and Paul is saying that's for shameful gain. Stop it. Right? That's not the way to live in a loud and chaotic culture. That doesn't actually bring peace or hope. Those are all just lies. And we certainly see that today where we are tempted to get back to these rules and regulations in the midst of our chaotic culture. But they actually don't give us peace. They actually don't give us hope. Their lies, just like following Zeus, is a lie. So the question is, how do we faithfully follow Jesus in the midst of a loud and chaotic culture? And so we back up just a little bit to the very beginning of Titus chapter 1, where Paul invites and, and, and sort of introduces himself in this letter He says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, and look what he says about God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. So in the midst of a culture that is constantly lying and bringing chaos and noise, what does Paul say about our God? He doesn't lie. Is that refreshing? I think it should be, right? We live in a, in a world, we have a God that doesn't lie. No matter how chaotic or loud things get around us, God does not lie. And Paul then encourages Titus, in the midst of this God who doesn't lie, who's been in charge from the foundation of the world, he says, then Titus, what I need you to do is appoint elders and pastors who stand firm in the truth of this God that doesn't lie. And he describes what the elders should look like. And this is how he, he phrases it here. He says, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone this is how he describes the elders. If anyone above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination, for an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the, 
to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. So in the midst of a loud and chaotic culture and world, Paul reminds us that we have a God that doesn't lie, and he says, appoint the, there to be leaders in the church, elders in the church, and if you were to sum up the characteristics that I just read there of these leaders in the church, how would you sum them up? Are they Zeus-like? Right, where they're trying to take power and glory for themselves? No. I'd sum them up in humility, right? The husband of one wife, not really given to debauchery, self-controlled, a lover of what is good, hospitable, holding firm to the trustworthy word that was taught, holding firm to what God has done, this God who doesn't lie, and what he has done. And what has the God that doesn't lie done for us? Well, he, right, rather than making you ascend to greatness with him, what did God do for you? He descended down to you. God comes to you in the midst of the chaos of your life, in the midst of the chaos of the sin, even in your own heart, and in the midst of the chaos of the sin of the world all around you. God comes down to you. At the fullness of time, right, God sent his son to be born of a woman, born under the law, born in that chaos on Christmas Day to love you, and serve you, and give you peace. He didn't come down and say, oh, you better get back to the rules. He doesn't come down and say, oh, you better ascend to greatness. But Jesus comes down to suffer and die and save you, even in the chaos. And he does that. He dies, but then he rises from that chaos. He rises from that sin that we might have the promise that we will never be separated from him. That's the promise of a God who doesn't lie. And so Paul says, in the midst of this chaotic world that's kind of all about themselves, well, appoint for yourself leaders who model this, who are full of humility, standing in that truth of a God that doesn't lie, of a God who came to save you. Well, Paul, I think, speaks specifically kind of to pastors and overseers. I think that's a good model for not just me, but all of us in the room. In the midst of a chaotic and loud culture, as we live standing firm in that truth of a God that doesn't lie, that God has saved us and loved us and brings us that peace, we go out in that same humility. That others in the midst of the chaotic world might rest in him. And what Jesus has done to bring hope, not just to you and me, but hope to the world. And I hope that we would do that. That we'd go rest in this promise of our God who does not lie. Amen. May the peace that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting.